You're listening to the winning literary show, Off the Shelf Books Talk Radio, live with host Denise Turney, author of the books Long Walk Up, Portia, Love More Over Me, Spiral, Love Has Many Faces, and Rosetta's Great Hope. Turn up your dial and get ready for a blast of feature author interviews, 411 on book festivals, writing conferences, and so much more. Ready? Let's go. Sometimes later becomes never. Do it now. That's a kickoff to our Off the Shelf Book Talk Radio Show, but it's February 13, 2021, a day before Valentine's Day. So happy Valentine's Day out there to all of our Off the Shelf listeners. Again, I just want to say that one more time just as we launch this February 13th show. Sometimes later becomes never. I'll do it later. I'll get to it later. I'll change later. I'll improve on that later. Sometimes later becomes never. Do it now. And that quote is from Credited to Anonymous. I want to welcome you again to our Saturday, February 13th, 2021 show. Happy, happy, blessed Valentine's Day. Whether you, you, we put so many constraints around things, whether you're single in a relationship, everybody's in a relationship. You're in a relationship with your neighbors. You're in a relationship with the people who are around you. If you don't have a home, the people around you, you're in relationships we have relationships every time we walk in the store with the other people in the store, our colleagues, our relatives, our family. We're all in relationships. So have a wonderful, wonderful Valentine's Day this year. And i got to ask you guys, how good of a mystery sleuth are you? Are you good at figuring out who did it before it's revealed on the TV show? I love watching mysteries and thrillers. I was watching one last night that kind of scared me, so I changed the channel. But I, to see what's going to happen, how what's going to be the final in, outcome, if you love a thriller and you also value relationships, there are these five friends, these five guys, they meet in college, they're friends for life. They're friends for life. And there is a, a, I mean, a truly soulmate relationship. And this doesn't mean it's easy, but these two people belong together. If you value relationships, and you like a good mystery because there's a murder mystery in here, I encourage you to get a copy of Love Pull Over Me Now. You can get it in ebook or in print. If you don't see it, just ask the store clerk for it. Just ask the clerk because it's carried by the largest book distributors in the world. You will be so glad that you gifted yourself with a copy of Love Pour Over Me. And now let us go and meet our very special off-the-shelf guest. If you came here, you know, we this is the start of the year. We still we're very focused on COVID until we it gets better under control. But this is a time of year when people start thinking about it's, it's the very end of December, right when the new year kicks off, probably through the end of this month, probably never, not too much into March. People start really thinking about the life changes. Some people are making jobs changes, career changes. Some of them have been driven by COVID. Some people say, I don't want to go back to the office. I'm switching my careers to a job where I don't have to go back. Some people, I'm going to take better care of my health, have better with my children, whatever it is. This is this is a key time when people make good changes. And so this guest is on time. And our special off-the-shelf guest this morning is false. I hope I'm saying his name right. It's not a hope. That he corrects me, false Regario, and he is a clinical trainer and a therapist. He's also a published research author, and he's written the book, The Fix Yourself Handbook, using the process way of life to transform your life into a happy, healthy journey. And over more than for, for over more than forty years, false has worked to help people in prison, nursing homes substance abuse centers, and more. And for over 40 years, he ran a private practice at the Community Psychological Center in Bangor, Pennsylvania, where he specialized in individual, family, substance abuse, women's issues, and marriage couples counseling. Please, please, please check Foss out online at falsregario.com, and I'm going to spell it F A U S T R U G G I E R O dot com. F a u s t r u g g two g's i e r o dot com false dot com. We are just honored to have false here with us 
on off the shelf this morning. I'm hoping I pick up the right line. I'm hoping I'm picking up the right line. Welcome to Off the Shelf, Faust. Denise, thanks for inviting me. I'm thrilled to be here. Oh, we're just so happy to have you. And as I was telling our listeners, and we've been on the air now going on over 15 years, this is a time of year when a lot of people start thinking about the, the changes they want to make in their life. And it's really, I think, a, a smart move. I do it as a writer. I do a year in review over my whole life at the end of the year. And what changes do I want to make? Because we have to do that work. It's not just going to happen on its own. But before we get into sharing these tips, talking about your book, false. I, these first questions I ask every guest who comes on the show. And I tell them, when I first started off the shelf more than 15 years ago, I just went right into the questions. And listeners would email me, say, don't do that. To give us a little background on the guests before you start asking the questions. So these first, I would say, four questions I ask every guest who comes on. So to kick it off, could you tell off the shelf listeners where you grew up and what life was like for you growing up? You know, I grew up, I'm here in Pennsylvania. And I grew up in a little town. Uh, I'm Italian. The whole town was Italian. And uh, it's called Rosetto, Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, we grew up in, in, in the era, I'm back in the 60s when I grew up. I was born in the mid-50s. Uh, and everyone was just family-oriented. You know, you talked about relationships in your intro. And that's what it was. It was un- not uncommon just to walk into someone else's house, sit down, and you're having breakfast or lunch or dinner with them. And, and that's just the way we grew up. Everything was simple. Everything was, you know, God, family, and love and uh, and it was just a nice way to live, and it, it really created the person that I am as I've moved forward and uh, continue to be in service of other people. So, uh, 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 how how close where you grew up? How close is it to Philadelphia? Oh, about an hour and a half at the most. Uh, yeah, I'm we're, we're, I'm about uh, 30 minutes from the Lehigh Valley, so you know Lehigh Valley is probably 40 minutes from uh, from uh, Philly. Oh, okay. Now, as a child, you you, you you mentioned already how growing up and the support you had from your family and the community growing up kind of led you into this life of service to others. But when you were a little boy, what did you what did you dream of becoming when you grew up? Well, you know, I had the usual aspirations. Uh, yeah, you know, as, you know, the sports figure and the the actor and the director and all that kind of stuff. But I've always got pulled. Uh, into other people and, and what they were telling me about themselves, and uh, I could never get away from that, uh, you know. And I've I've been able to do that other sports things. I I've done uh, some fan development for the Phillies. I still do that. Uh, so I've been you know uh, fortunate to be to continue doing that. And uh, you know I, I I do the I did the book and I those kind of things. So I always kept myself moving in other directions. But I've always been pulled back into uh into helping people that's just it's what i do best it's what i love the most oh, wow you know what and the, the, the need for that even now you know i tell people when this covid is over it's like when we had a great recession we p- people there are a lot of people who didn't get laid off even now during covid but there are people who lost like their parents some kids have been orphaned through this and you talk about PTSDs because it's not just military people who deal with it. Once it's all over, there's some people's lives will be permanently changed. And then the work you do, that's when it's just so so valuable. So can you tell us, Foss, what does a what what does a clinical trainer do? Well, in in, in my profession, I'm a psychologist who is you know, been in a variety of different settings and, uh, and private practice. Uh, the clinical trainers, what we, what we do is, and I've done this for the state of Pennsylvania and for a number of other places, we sit down with other people who are uh, helping people, other psychologists, counselors, things like that, and we help them to become better at the, uh, at the art, uh, not so much the, uh, the science of, uh, of helping people, but the art, be, being able to, to connect with people and understand them and go deep. Uh, that, that's always been my goal. Uh, it's real easy to, to, to uh, you know, master the technique. That, you know, most people who are helping can do that, but to get in there and really connect with people, that's what I, I, I want to train people to do so that they can understand, be a little bit more empathetic, and then being able to, to based on the information that they, uh, they garnish from those situations, to help people the way those particular people need to be helped. Oh, so so how, many, how many years, 
to be a psychologist, you have to. Do you need a? Is it a master's degree, or do you have to get a, a a doctorate degree? And I've heard some psychologists say to get that PhD, the psychotherapist, her himself, has to undergo really intensive psychotherapy with a therapist themselves, so they can work through their own issues before they start helping somebody else. But how many years of training and experience did you have? before you, you started practicing as a, a psychologist? You know, I, I, that comes in kind of two layers. Uh, I've got about six and a half years, so I have a master's degree, uh, and then I've done some, some of the doctorate training, uh, continue to train. You know, that's the, the, the uh, most important part of doing what we do is to continue to train. It's not just getting a, uh, the degree. It is to continue to train and, and, and uh, master all the new techniques that are coming out. Um, so in, in, in Pennsylvania, you have to be, li- to be licensed. You have to go at least six years to get that master's degree. Um, and then, you, you know, of course, you should continue the training. And the other thing is uh, training uh, occurs in other directions. You know, I've, I've been in about seven or eight different uh, clinical settings, and you, uh, you pick up lots of information, lots of, uh, of, of uh, tools that you can use and apply later on. So when you put the two together, your training, which should always be long-term, I always say that to people when they're going to go get help from someone, is that person really, really trained to do this? So have they put years and years of, of uh, scholastic training in, and then do they have years of experience? You put the two together, and you can really have a lot to build on and to draw on when people come in and, and they need help. Mm. Now, what type of work did you do? You said you worked at several clinical settings. The, uh, yeah. This is the last question before we start talking about your book. What type of work did you do at the Community Psychological Center in Bangor, Pennsylvania? Did you primarily do, were you a, primarily a marriage counselor, substance abuse counselor? What, what was your focus while you worked at the at that center? Yeah, well, you know, uh, even before I started the. Um the private practice, and my philosophy was always to be as diversified as possible uh, because so many different people are going to come in the office. So I even started that with my training. Most people will go and be, you know, when they're in college, and you know, just go to clinical psychology. That's just kind of the study of abnormal development. Things go wrong. I, I did that, but I also studied normal development. It's called developmental psychology. This way, I, I really had a good fix on what was normal, and I thought that that uh, that was a good way to bridge that whole the whole uh, treatment issues. Uh, then when I came out, I wanted to diversify again, so I started working. I, my initial jobs were working with deaf kids. I did the behavioral management for uh, someone working with deaf children. I've worked in uh, senior living facilities. I have done work uh, inpatient drug and alcohol facilities and, and mental health clinics. I worked in a prison for five years. Uh, you know, so I've been around a little bit. I've, I've been able to get the tools, and then 30, little about 32 years ago, I, I started the private practice. So by that time, I had enough information from a lot of different places, starting from really at the age of five or six through geriatrics, that you know, when someone comes into my office, I have a lot to draw on. Wow, you know what? And I thank you for the work you've done. And and you don't you don't say I won't help these people or or I won't help uh, those people. I, 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 I can only imagine how many lives you touch that you might not even you might not even be aware of. I, I saw a show years ago before we talk about your book, and a, a psychotherapist was working with prisoners, and I mean, ho- who committed these horrific crimes. And he said he just was struggling to get through to some of them. He, and he said, "You have to do the work each individual. The therapist is not a magician; they can't do all the work." And but he was he, he could he, they had a few that he saw really were wanted to do the work and change but he just he was whatever he was everything he was trying it was not working it was not working he was getting frustrated and so he started doing some type of work where he would say to them please forgive me for not in front of them on his own please forgive me for whatever whatever issue they were dealing with and he said he saw I mean, almost miraculous change. To, to, like he was connected to the process himself, even though he hadn't known these people when they were kids or anything. It's amazing what psychology can do. I, I mean, it, it's just truly amazing. So I want to talk about your book for the, our listeners who might. Some people don't want to deal with psychology or the mind because I, I had somebody who told me, I know I need help, 
And they said, I said, you should go to a psychotherapist. I'm not a therapist. Like, you can't keep dumping stuff on me. And they said, I know I need to, but I'm scared of what will come up. I'm scared of what I'll find. So some people are scared to go to a therapist. They're, they're maybe afraid that therapists will see too much into them, maybe judge them, or something will come up, and they're like, oh, my God, I can't deal with that. So as as we talk about your book, maybe ways to help people remove this mental health care stigma and to become more comfortable with seeking care so it's not this threatening thing where people feel so scared. So to, so to begin, how the, how did the work that you did and continue to do impact your writing when you wrote the book, the Fix Yourself Handbook, using the process way of life to transform your life into a happy, healthy journey? And before you answer that, this thought just popped into my mind. There's so much fear around getting mental health care. It's just... Some people are scared to even go to a doctor because they don't want to know they have cancer. They don't want to know something's wrong. They just don't want to deal with it. Same thing with mental health. People will buy tons of self-help books because so, it's like they can do it in private. There's nobody there, and they can try to. But sometimes we do need a professional. So I really want to see if during this interview we can try to remove some of that stigma. But how did the work that you did impact the writing? of the book, and again, I want to give the title for our listeners, The Fix Yourself Handbook, Using the Process Way of Life to Transform Your Life into a Happy, Healthy Journey. How did your work impact, impact the writing of that book? Well, you know, Denise, the, the book is essentially what I do uh, in my private practice. Um, you know, we, we're trained in school, and we learn all the techniques and all the, the various uh, ways to help people. And then you get into the actual helping environment, and some of those things will apply, and some of them don't apply so well. So by the time I was doing this for, gee, about uh, almost 20 years, I would put together something that was really working for my people, and that is that process way of life. And it's nothing more than going inside ourselves and getting all those special gifts we already have. And that really addresses the question you said, that stigma, because people think they're going to come into counseling and, and they're going to hear all the horrors about themselves. But what we're really going to do, beside weeding out some of those things that are, are hurting you, we're, we're, we're going underneath to find all the good stuff, all the beauty. And that's the part that they're having, anyone is having problems connecting with because we focus on the negative so much. So in, in my practice, I put together a program of pro Processes and, and there are 52 processes, and there are things like honesty, gratitude, passion, creativity, things like that. And I help people connect with those. Now, that's what I do in my office. Uh, I go deep, deep, and you know, we, we get our rapport. We get to the point that they trust that I'm going to help them. Then we start dealing with the, the junk, if you will, the stuff that's holding people back. And I, and I help them work through that. Once we get to those points, we want to start getting into all the good stuff, and that's what and that's what um really motivated the book so the book is based really on my counseling uh, methodologies. It's based on what I do here in the office. So buying the book, essentially, you get an office experience in text form, and that's what I wanted it to be. You know, your approach is, I think, kind of different from what I've seen. Well, my, my, other, my approach and, is very I, different, and, and you know, yes. Because most, most therapists just zone in on, we're not going to talk about the good, we want to zone in on the problem and then you say so focused on the problem. I love I love that approach to deal. To deal, you said you deal with the problem. You don't you don't gloss over it or ignore it. But then let's let's also talk about those good those good qualities as well. I, I just that approach. I really it's new, it's a new approach. From well, what you know. I heard. I'm very pragmatic. I'm very practical in the way I do things. Uh, so I always want people to get to the point that there's going to be a plan for their life, a lifetime plan. But if they're going to come in my office and every time they sit down we say, well, let's go through all these horrible things, eventually they're either going to get tired of coming in or they're going to get frustrated and say, when do I start feeling good? So you know, I, I kind of put myself on the other side of the desk, so to speak. Uh, how would I want someone to be treating me, counseling session? I would want that. I would really like to know that they like me, that they feel Feel good things about me. I like to know that uh, they're they're connecting with the good side of me, and they understand that I have these issues. But there's some good things in there, and I really want to get to those. So I'm not doing anything more than treating someone the way I want to be treated. Mm, I have to ask you this question, especially for I've heard even young younger and younger kids 
this is very concerning, not only on these psych, these mental health matters and strong ones, but going to therapists at younger and younger ages. Is this bec- is, is 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 psychotherapy becoming like a trend in some settings where it's like what what years ago, generations ago, the, the person would have just worked through it on their own as they age and have different experiences and different pers- pers- perspectives. But now it's like you send a six year old to a therapist. Like, wait a minute, is it is that? Do you see that happening as well? Yeah, you know what? Uh, w- w- the the culture has changed so much when you know when we were kids. I mean, the the nuclear family was still a little bit more intact, uh, but really across the nation, we're seeing divorce rates way up. We're seeing kids that just aren't being dealt with, and and parents go quickly to get them to a therapist. We're also seeing a culture that's going so fast. Uh, and there's so, and we're getting hit with so many things from so many different directions that you know we're, I'm seeing kids that are much younger. I'm getting people calling me and saying, you know, can I get my child in there? And I'll say, well, well what's the age? And they say seven. And and wow. at seven, they're they're dealing with issues that I look back to myself, and I didn't deal with probably till eleven or twelve. And these wow. minds are trying to grasp those things, but. You know, we have uh, we have the internet available. We have a, a cell phones. Everyone's connected to everyone all the time with no downtime. No, so, so uh, we we just don't have the time for ourselves to really get inside it and take that time and, and look at who we are and and all those kinds of things. And we're going so fast that they're coming in much younger and they're actually staying in therapy much later where you know years ago maybe i'd get into 40s and maybe early 50s now i'm seeing people come in who are in their 60s and close to 70 because everyone seems to be confused and we're going so fast the networks for for support aren't as strong as they used to be and people are just trying to figure out how they're going to get by they're not even worried anymore about being happy and productive they're just trying to get by wow you, this and I, I, you will hear me thank you so much during this interview. The work that you do is is so important. Oh my goodness! It, I mean, you, you just reach one person effectively, and it could change generations, generations. I, we we was talking about you know kids and going into therapy, and 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 I really would encourage anybody struggling, whether it's with COVID nineteen and like you said, all these changes, and you, you can't get off, you cannot turn off the news. I just don't even watch it, but you you constantly bombarded with so much stuff that can upset you that 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 you can see why the fix yourself handbook could really be very impactful and beneficial to somebody right now and and in the future. But I wanted to ask you how powerful we're talking about kids. How powerful is childhood programming on our lives, and do do we ever get fully away from it? You know what? The younger we get to anyone, uh, the better we are because the way the mind works is it grasps things and it, the, and the more it sees them, the stronger the, the ability to work with those items gets. So, you know, I always tell people that learning, and that's what the brain is all about, constantly learning. Uh, learning is nothing more than repetition over time. So if we get to kids early, then they're, they're, they're kind of the root for them to, to learn and, and the way they process becomes more positive. And the more positive re- for, uh, reinforcement we give at a young age, the better we are. And, and a lot of people tell you, by the time you get kids to 10, 11 years old, a lot of the way they think and the way they behave is already formulated. That doesn't mean it can't change, but it means that, that that's how the brain works. It, so the, the longer, the, no, the faster we get to them and the longer they have to process information that's positive, the better they are because otherwise that internal language can be very, very negative, and we want to teach them how to be positive thinkers. Mm. Can, you, can you please give off-the-shelf listeners, you told us about your approach, in in the clinical setting and how you've incorporated that in the book again the fix yourself handbook using the process way of life to transform your life into a happy healthy journey can you just give us some of the uh, a, a brief overview of some of the key specific items you cover in the the different chapters in the book 
Absolutely. You know, when I wrote the book, I wanted it to be a journey, just like life is a journey. I wanted people to sit down and say, okay, I'm starting this from a point that I'm kind of, uh, I, I call it running on autopilot, just following the crowd, and I'm not, not even sure I'm, what, what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. You know, you're confused and conflicted and emotionally in a lot of pain. I wanted to, them to know they could start from there, and if they read the book and they follow the way I wrote that book, they'll get to the end, and they can probably give themselves a pat on the back and say, you know what, I'm using all these principles every day, and it works, which is what counseling is all about. And the way I start things for them is I first thing I want them to do is take their, their, their minds off that autopilot. Let's stop following the crowd. Let's, not, let's look at the routines that, that maybe aren't so healthy and that, that are holding you back, and let's just stop that for a moment. Then we can get the, the we, by then we can get the uh, place where we're start we need to start from in terms of the counseling, and then and then I say to them here's what we need to do we got to slow your life down because you're going so fast you're not thinking about what you're doing and oftentimes that's by design we don't want to think about what we're doing because what we're doing because we think it's painful or it or emotionally it hurts us in some way, but we're going to slow down so that we can get that brain to think a little bit and not just be uh, going real fast on emotions. And then I want them to get very honest with themselves. Uh, and that's a, a difficult thing for many people to do. You know, it's, and, I, and, I, and I tell them, we're not doing this for anyone else, so don't worry about getting embarrassed. This is between you and I. Uh, we just want you to be honest with yourself, because if you're not honest with, you, with yourself, nothing, I don't care what program you're involved in, nothing is going to work. So I, I want them to be honest with themselves, and then I want them to start taking a step back, and before they react to something, let's teach you how to work with your, with your intellect. Let's get your brain around whatever the problem is and not be reacting. If we can get those kind of things started, now that jump starts the whole program, and then I take them through all the steps until we get to what I call the higher order steps, like uh, humility uh, and creativity, passion, gratitude, love, faith, all those kinds of things. We're going to put the whole picture in. And by the time that journey is over, you're going to have touched base with all these different parts of yourself that you probably have not, either have not addressed in a long time or may have never been there before. Mm. What what does it look like when our life is going, I mean, change. I, I was born in the 60s, and I feel like this is a whole other world. <laughs> it is. Things are changing so, like at a warp speed. What are what are some signs for our listeners that their life might be going too fast? I mean, everybody's life is at a warp speed, so you wouldn't maybe know. What are some signs that is it, they, a person could really benefit from slowing down? Yeah. You know, the question you just, you just asked hits the core of the book. There's a con- the concept I'm talking about, what we're looking to get to is a process, I, uh, uh, a state I call internal balance. You know, and human beings are really formulated with four attributes. We, we are physical entities. We're intellectual. That is, our brains wrap around things. We have emotions, which are a little bit more primal. Uh, and then we have uh, the spiritual part of ourselves, which kind of connects to the essence uh, in, in ourselves. And I tell people, you're going to know when you're starting to make progress because physically you're going to feel like you can catch your breath a little bit. Things have slowed down. Uh, intellectually, you have a little bit more clarity of thought. You're able to get to the facts and, and not get so conflicted. Emotionally, you're not bouncing all over the place. You seem to be a little bit more calmed down, and that's nice. And spiritually, if you're willing to work with that part of yourself, you can connect more with the core of yourself. And, and those things are very easy to measure because when you look at it, the, the way we're going today, uh, our bodies are all over the place. We don't sleep like we should. We don't eat like we should. We're taking medicines. We're taking accelerants to, to speed us up. You know, when we get to the point that the body is healthy and feels good, you know it. When intellectually you can say, all right, this happened like the pandemic. Let me take a step back and let me think about what I have to do, not react all over the place. You know that's happening. When emotionally you're not losing it, you know, you're not having those spells where you just you're yelling at people, or inside you're feeling that horrible anxiety. When that's not there anymore, again, you know it. And when those things happen, often spiritual, then you you're kind of going inside yourself and you're saying, "I can feel what's inside me." These things are very easy to measure because it's such a, a change from the way we live life now. Mm. 
Yeah, you 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 will notice it. It might you might not know exactly what caused it, but you would know. And 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 hopefully we have some. If we have any working mothers listening to this show, hopefully the book will. They're trying to juggle your family, working from home, and I'm told that working mothers are just like oh, they said they're getting like an internal primal scream. It's just too mm-hmm. much right now. So we we talked about life is just going way too fast. But this is another topic you cover in your book. Are there signs that we're engaged in unhealthy routines? Not just that life's going too fast, but we might have we might have some routines that we need to change. And particularly if we've been in a routine for decades and we saw our parents in that same routine, so we think that's just the way to live. You know, and that's an interesting topic because you're talking about, uh, depending on the terminology you want to use, either normalization or what the brain calls habituation, which is really just accommodating, just getting used to one particular situation, one way to live, and doing it. It becomes normal, um, and and what we and that's what I you know what I tell people. We want to let's take that apart and define that. Let's look at what you're defining as normal in your life. Is it normal to smoke a couple packs of cigarettes? or to be drinking four or five beers or, or mixed drinks at the end of the day? Is it normal to yell at people or, or never to reinforce them? Um, I, I go into all those things, and that's the real key when I say taking life off autopilot. Let's start, not only stop the process of what you're doing, let's define it, uh, and good and bad, not just the, um, uh, the negative. Let's define both of them so you can compare and contrast a little bit and say, okay, that probably can't work, but I never thought about it because mom and or dad or whoever was significant in my life always did it. Not only that, the culture goes in a particular way. You know, we're at a point now with the way we treat each other, which is completely different when the, from the time you and I were raised. We were far more personable, and we really thought about how we were going to talk to people. And, 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 you know, today it's going so fast that nobody's checking anything. Um, so I, if, you sl- if we slow it down, it's not only slowing it down, it's defining what's there once we slow it down. We're not just slowing it down. That's not an end in and, in and of itself. We slow down so that we can define, so that we can take it apart and then weed out what we don't like or doesn't work for us and then maximize what does work. Wow. You know what? I, again, I recommend the Fix Yourself Handbook. It can impact it. When you get healthier, it impacts not only you but everybody who you're around to some degree. I think they can see the change. Some people move away from you because they see it's changing. and they don't want to deal with it. And you can draw even healthier people into your space as well. But you, you talked about this earlier, and I've heard whether you're doing psychotherapy or there's something, a change you want to have happen in your life. It could be something as simple as losing weight or switching, again, or switching a job. You want to, you want to get out of an a unhealthy, physically violent relationship uh, which some people struggle with. Uh, can you tell us, you, t- you talked about this before, honesty. Can you tell us about the importance of honesty and courage when it comes to changing our lives for the better? Just We, we swear we're being honest. I hear people say, I'm, I'm being honest, I'm being honest, I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> and we, we're stuck in a situation that we say, I guess I'm trying everything, and it's just not working. And you hear people say that. I'm trying everything, and nothing's working. Can you tell us about the importance of being honesty and maybe give an example of uh, the importance of being of honesty and courage when it comes to changing our lives for the better? You know, Lisa, I love when people uh, connect the dots like you just did. It, it, the reason we're not not so honest with ourselves because it takes courage to get there. You're, you know, in the book I talk about honesty as kind of peeling the onion. And uh, what I say is, you know, we all say we're we're honest, and that's like that first. Uh, layer off the onion it's the paper you know it doesn't do anything it's dead uh, you know we, we discard that um doesn't have much meaning and that's our first level of honesty because our first level of honesty is always designed to keep us comfortable that's what we don't understand so we think we're being honest and it feels good when we say that but that's not really the case the second layer you know you take that first layer of the life part of the onion off and now your eyes burn a little bit and you can taste it and you smell that and now you're getting to the point because it gets a little uncomfortable 
Now, you know, so now that's where the courage has to be there. Keep going. You might get to the next level, and now it's really uncomfortable. So honesty should be something that regardless of the feeling associated with it, we're willing to move forward on because that's where all the information for positive change lives. It's as simple as that. So when we, and, and, and in my own life, you know, because uh, just like everyone else, you know, people will think that I wrote this book and I got it all together. You know, you, I'm sure you know we all go through the insanity to get to the other side, and that's why we can help other people. So this is not something that I haven't gone through. So that pain is temporary. That's the first thing I tell people, just like with the onion. It's temporary, and what happens after you cut the onion up and you do what you're going to do with it, you make a a dish that tastes real good and you love it, and that's what will happen with your honesty. Have enough courage to go deep, go a few layers in, get a little uncomfortable, find the facts there, and then those are the ones you need to work with to make some changes. And if you do that, that sets the stage for everything else that you're going to do. And it's worth it. It is so, it's so, it's so you, worth it, yes. You know, because you, when you peel that yeah. layer off, you're going to go under and find beauty, too. That's the part that people don't tell you. When you go out, when you go deep inside yourself, that's where all the beauty that you've covered up with all this life stuff or, or that life bit into and took, it seems like it took it away from you. That's where you're going to go find all those, those places that have been covered up. So you're not just going to go in there and find horrible stuff about yourself. You're going to find beautiful things and you're going to take some things out of there that are going to uncover more beauty. Because everything we have, everything we need to do to move forward is already inside us. That's what I keep telling people. You know, what I'm preaching is not something new. It's not some, you know, fix your life in 10 easy steps or some new age uh, program that I put together. It's that we all have inside us. I'm just teaching people how to get to it. Mm. Oh, my goodness. Now, you know what? I've heard this almost all my physical experience. I've heard this. Trust your gut. Trust your gut. If it doesn't feel right, don't do it. If, if, so I have to ask you this because I've also heard people say our emotions can trick us, and you you can't just go based off of emotions. People tell me gamblers do it. That's how they get gambling addicts. I'm going in. I feel like this is this time. This is it. This is the time. And <laughs> do it again, and you don't. You end up losing again. So I wanted to ask you, which really, really false? Which is the better guide, our brain or our emotions? And, and why do you say this? Okay. Well, I'm, again, emotions are wonderful if they can be expressed over healthy circumstances or at least over the facts. And, and, and that's what I, you know, I, I have a chapter in the book I call I over E, which is intellect over emotion. That doesn't mean that we don't emote, that we don't show our emotions. It just means that our, our intellect should be able to get the facts as they exist. Emotions and, and the way we follow those first, they're always designed to make us feel comfortable, but that's short-lived. That's the problem. If, if we're willing to get our minds wrapped around the facts, then what we are, resp- we are reacting to, that emotion then, is based on the facts, and then it's a far more pure measure of what's really going on. So uh, do I go more toward emotion, uh, toward intellect? Yes, I do. But I want people to be, to be in touch with their emotions and feel good about expressing them. I just like to see them express them over what's factual, what's real, uh, and, and not be irrational and not be out of control. Uh, by all means, emote. Show people your emotions. Be able to feel your emotions yourself, but have, try to feel them after you have the facts. And by, when you're doing that, it's a much clearer, much more uh, uh, exact way to live life. And what you're emoting over now becomes healthy. Mm. Yes, and you know what? That I think that's one you could almost uh, focus a whole show around or write an entire you could. book around. Because mm-hmm. a lot of us just go straight off our emotions. I, I mean, we, uh, you could just start with domestic violence or any type of violence. It's just straight out of emotion. Not even thinking, just I, I felt a lot of emotion, and this is what I did. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I, oh, that one is a big one. That one is a big one, and I, it really hamstrings a lot of people. Why, why is it important? You talked about this earlier, and I just hope that the people who listen to this show live now and in the archives, I just really, really hope it reaches the right people. But why is it important 
you mentioned this earlier in the show. Why is it important for us to actually slow down to enjoy life? Why is that so important? Well, you know what? If you, if, if you just look at that, just even on the surface level, uh, everything we do goes real fast So in, in this culture. But what happens is, you know, we go from, we're so concerned about getting from point A to point B, but life does not exist from at point, only at point A and point B. That span of time between them, that's where all the living occurs. And, you know, we become destination people. I keep writing about that, but life is not about destinations. It's a journey, day-to-day journey. And the stuff of life, all of life is lived in those particular places every day, moment by moment. When you slow down, you get to experience all those moments that's what life is all about. You know, the old uh, take your time and smell the coffee or, or the roses or whatever it may be. It's all that, uh, it's that ability to experience all the seconds of your life. And if you're willing to do that and then work with the, all those seconds of your life, you can create a beautiful, a wonderful journey. But we can't do it going fast because going fast has us going from one quick destination to another and we're not satisfied when we get to that destination. And unfortunately, by the time we get to the destination, it most of the time isn't what we thought it was going to be anyway. So we get disappointed <laughs> a lot. Oh my God! I actually heard I've heard I heard somebody say that the, the funny thing about humans is we never like where we are. I don't care where we are. It's always I would be happy if this thing would change. If I if I if this was if this were different, and they said that is a very peculiar thing about humans. I have a pet turtle. My pet turtle is just like so chilled out, and relax. Just let the sun shine, and I can just sit in my aquarium, and I'm fine. As humans, we it's always I've got to get here, and I've got to get there, and once this happens, and and then we never get to happy. We never get there. We just constantly running after it. Oh, my goodness, the Fix Yourself Handbook. Can you, Falls, as we are go- dealing with COVID-19 and people being laid off their jobs, and I'm, I'm, my, my heart goes out to working mothers or fathers who've taken care of their kids, and you got it's just the stress of your, 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 your workspaces, your home spaces, your living spaces, your, and it's like it never shuts off. Can you share a few tips on how we can trust uh, uh, how we can trust during this COVID for those who've lost loved ones. You didn't even get to have a funeral like normal. Uh, can you share a few tips on how we can trust the unfolding of our lives when t- drastic change or tragedy occurs? How can we trust it then? You know, uh, I get, and I'm getting that question a lot now uh, because of what we've been through. And, and what I've told people is it really has to do with how strong you want to be on the inside. Um, This has been a a horrible situation, and as you said when when we opened the program, you know, we're going to get through the virus, and the virus will be gone, and then we're going to have rebuilding in front of us, and that's going to be a massive project, uh, but by by no means undoable. Uh, We have to learn where our strengths are. That's, again, what I'm preaching in this book to be strong on the inside. As strong as we are on the inside will relate directly to whatever we deal with in our lives. And if we're strong and we continually go out and use those strengths, then we start to trust ourselves. Then we're able to say, you know what, whatever comes up, I can't predict what's going to happen, but I know that when I engage in, in that battle, I trust that I have the ability to come through that. And, if, and that's self-trust. If we get that going, we get strong on the inside and we get that going, our abilities to take the environment and whatever the world throws at us become drastically uh, more efficient. So we really want to get strong on the inside, focus on that part of things, because that's what we can control. We can't control what the world's going to throw at us. Mm. Can you give a, a, an example of someone uh, – and it doesn't have to be actual. Maybe it's a compilation of people you've worked with. Give a, uh, maybe two examples of someone living in the present or living in the now, because it's another thing you focus on. Can you give an example of somebody who's living? What does it mean? What does it look like to live in the now, to live in the present? You just hit on it before when you were talking about, you know, human beings are never satisfied with that moment. 
Um, you know, we always want to get to the next place. Um, and it's not because the, for most of us that the moment we're in is so bad. It may be for some people, uh, people of abuse and, uh, you know, uh, horrible illnesses and things like that. But for most of us, we are always focused on the future. What it looks like to be happy now is just the opposite of what you said, to be void of having to um, wait for the next destination. When your mind is saying, you know what, I'm going to plan for that. Maybe it's going to be the vacation or I want to you know, uh, establish that new business or the relationship or whatever it may be. If I get there, that's great. I'm going to do my best to do so, but I'm going to make every moment count. And I really like being right where I am. And, 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 and the, the, the way to answer that question is to simply say, I'm not uh, pining for that destination. It, I'm, if it doesn't happen, I'm okay because my life, is the, what I'm creating inside of me is good. And if, again, it, most of those destinations are external things. If we were yeah. saying, my God, the only thing I wanted to do is get stronger inside, and I'm going to focus on my, my processes and my program to get there, and that's, you know, I, I, w- when I get to that point, I'm going to feel better. But that's internal. That's great. But we're focusing on external things, which usually have absolutely no meaning to the quality of our lives. Mm-hmm. So when, we, when we're not doing that anymore, when we're not looking outside of ourselves, and we can say, the pandemic's here, i got to stay inside, but you know what? I'm strong enough, uh, and I'm going to make the moments count, and I'm going to like my life. I'm going to love my life where I am, and I don't have to be thinking, I'm not going to be okay till this pandemic's over. I got, this pandemic's been with us for almost a year. If, if it's with us for another six months or eight months, are you going to say a year and a half, almost two years? Wow. You're, you're going to wipe off your life's uh, timeline? I hate to even think that you know, in my life. I hate to think I would do that. If that's what it, you know, life threw me, I got to I figure out a way to say I'm okay today. So yeah. I'm not thinking about when this is over because now my head is in a place that doesn't even exist. Wow. What exists you know, is the moment I'm breathing in. I want that to feel good. So it's void of th- uh, uh, it's void of two things: going in the past and taking things that are negative and are going to hurt me because that's what we tend to do, or going to the future because if I can just get there, I'll be okay. Neither points in time have any, any real life. Let's stay in the moment, the moment we're breathing in, which is where our life is. Mm, oh, thank you for sharing that. Thank you so much. And, again, I remember that, that quote that said the peculiar thing about humans, not a pet if you've ever had a pet. Your pet is like, I'm fine, I'm fed, I, I'm, I'm cool. It's, it's, I'm fine. But humans, it's almost like we're always either trying to revisit the past or when this thing in the future occurs, then I'll be happy. But the future is is an illusion. We never live in the future, ever. So what you're saying, you know, you have to learn how to tap into your own inner strength and learn to be happy and at peace right now. Uh, uh, two more questions before we start talking about the, the writing of the book as we coming down to the last ten minutes in the show. But... I have to ask you this. We talked again about emotions. I've heard people say, go with your gut, go to emotion, go with your gut feeling. Everybody's a psychotherapist, Paul. Oh, <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> do, do, do all people lie to themselves? We talked about honesty. I really, really, I've heard, I've heard that we do, but we don't think we're lying to ourselves. Do we really all lie to ourselves? And if so, why? Is it, why do we do it and, and not even know we're doing it? We do it because our brains are designed to keep us safe, secure, and happy. And our brains will do anything it, it, it can to get to that end. So if it means lying to us because we don't want to face negativity and feel bad, it will do that. Uh, and if mm-hmm. we become proficient at that, we're going to tell ourselves things that don't really exist, but we never really get happy. We just don't face anything. So the, the key, again, is, is to go and get all the good stuff inside yourself, move the other stuff out of the way. But, yeah, we all do lie to ourselves, uh, and it's routine, and it's every day, and it's so automatic that we don't even realize we're doing it. The goal for the brain is just, I just want to feel good, and we do anything we can to get there. Wow, you know, the fix-yourself handbook, you guys. 
And you ladies, fix yourself, him, but you listening to it, Paul. He's speaking with conviction. He knows what he's talking about. You can hear it in your voice. The Fix Yourself Handbook, Using the Process Way of Life to Transform Your Life into a Happy, Healthy Journey. It just might be the thing that helps you get over the hump in 2021. Now, we hear a lot about self-love, uh, false. Just what is self-love? What What is that? Uh, again, another question I'm, I'm so thrilled you asked because we, you're right. We all hear this every I always call them the self-help gurus have said, yep, yeah, you've got to love yourself, and they keep on doing it, and no one ever tells us how to do it. And that's the way I wrote the book. I wanted to take all these various issues, you know, state what the issue was, like self-love, give people some information about it, and then go to the exact steps that we need to take to get there. You know, when it comes to self-love, the first thing we have to do, and we've been talking about it for almost an hour, is to learn how to like ourselves and like the world we live in. We cannot love ourselves and we cannot extend that love outward until we ourselves create, some, create a person that we like. Mm. That, that's always the first step. You know, like who you are, and to order to like who you are, again, we're going through all those processes, honesty and gratitude and humility and all those things. We're going in there and we're, we're creating a version of ourselves that we like. That's what it's all about. And we can do that. Again, we have everything inside us to do that. So once we get to the point that we really like the person we're creating and we like the world we're living in, then we can say it, we can feel it. We can feel it bubbling up. You know, I'm really loving this. I get up every day and I'm kind of charged to go forward. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to the people I'm going to be with. I can take all the things and all the people in my life and see them as gifts, not always as challenges. And then it, we, we begin, it, it's not that we make a decision to love ourselves. We can feel it coming, you know, coming through, but we have to create a person, that's us, and a world that we live in that we truly like to be part of. You, you, just just you, what you shared on this show alone has been, is, I can imagine how many people it could help. Your, your approach, you're very, you have a very like gentle approach. And so the book, the Fix Yourself Handbook, uh, Using the Process Way of Life to Transform Your Life into a Happy, Healthy Journey. I encourage our off-the-shelf listeners to get a copy of the book. It's, 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 it's something you, you feel like, I could really feel I could. It would help me to feel better. It, it, it could, I, in my life, whether you got the book or not, but you feel like, I, I, I feel like I could experience more peace. I could experience more happiness. I don't feel as happy as I could be right now. Maybe the book would be uh, uh, something that could be somewhat of a key to help you as you continue the journey forward. Now, how easy or difficult, you're a psychotherapist, you work in a clinical setting, you're, you're not like a novel writer or a screenplay writer. How easy or difficult was it for you, Foss, to actually sit down and write the book? You know, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about that, and uh, once I really researched what I wanted to do, knew how the design for the book, knew what the goals of the book were, which was to uh, simulate a counseling session, uh, show people that counseling journey and how safe and, 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 and beautiful it can be, then to sit down and write it was really easy. It was just another gift in my life. Um, and so I, I was able to draw on all the things I was doing in here and then put that into a text. Uh, so it was. It, it became kind of a labor of love. I spent, you know, it, it, it. By the time, from the time I started the book and researching the book, it was maybe three, four years in the making, and then to, to the time that it was published, uh, I just took it day by day, and I used. I really used the same philosophies I've been talking about. I stayed in the moment. I didn't think about when the book was going to be done. I didn't think about all those things. I just thought about the moment I was in and what I was writing in that moment and, and, and turned that into another beautiful part of my life. That's all I did. And, you know, and if you do that and you can make those, those on-the-way kind of parts of your life really feel good and feel beautiful, it's just another way to express the love that you have for the life that you're living. So it became very easy. Uh, you, and you know what? I'm, one thing that just popped into my head, and thank you for sharing that, I, I think a, a, a key to living a good life, if you take your prompts from the world, man, you may never get there. <laughs> it has to come from inside of you. 
Mm-hmm. That's you. It's, this is internal work. If you take your cues from whatever's going on in the world, you're gonna be tossed and tossed and tossed and tossed, and just feel like you're constantly in a storm. So you have it has to be this this inner work, whether it's spiritual or psychological. Now, what inspired you to sit down? You've got forty years under you. What inspired you to sit down and actually write this particular book? You know, you're right. Um, I'm the guy that, you know, one of those guys that uh, you know, we say never worked a day in his life. I, I come into the office every day, and I look at every person who sits with me as just, you know, the Lord gave me another gift here. And, and, and when you do that, there's such a passion for what you do that when you, you expand it to other things like a book or whatever it may be, it's just, again, another expression of the way you, 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 I'm living life. Uh, every moment of life is, is a gift. You and I sitting down today is a gift to me. So you, you enjoy every part of it. And that's just the way I treated writing the book. I, I, I've been doing this for 40 years. I still love to come into the office. Uh, I know that when... Uh, People read the book, and as they have been, they contact me and they ask questions, and that feels wonderful that they're engaging and that their lives are, are, are getting better. And that's always been what has motivated me. Uh, what, you, you know, for example, if I take a woman who's being horribly abused at home, and she's been that way for a long time, and we start to really get in there and start changing things around, and she starts to realize how much power she has inside her, and you watch that flower bloom, so to speak. Mm. That's just a wonderful thing. She's not. It's not just that woman that's getting that. I'm getting that too. So it, you, you experience it along with people, and it just continues to fuel life. Wow. Tell us about some things that readers have been saying about the Fix Yourself Handbook. The, the first thing that, that and it's the one I, I think I'm, I'm, I feel most proud about, is that they're saying finally someone is saying, here are the things you have to do. Here's the information, and here are the exact steps you need to take. And I did I did 36 chapters in the book, and I didn't make them long. They're four or five pages, so it doesn't bog you down. Uh, it presents a particular subject like honesty. It, it it presents all the information and the processes you have to use to make that happen. And then at the end of the chapter, in every chapter, it says, here, do these things, and if you do them, it, it, here's your roadmap. Here's the exact things you need to do to make it happen. Self-help doesn't seem to be written in that way. And that's kind of the movement that I and a few other people are kind of kind of put forward here. Let's get away from all the fluff, and let's get away from all the, the gimmicks. Let's get right down to the bare facts. Here's what you have to do. And then you can make your life better. And if you keep on doing them every day, everything gets a whole lot better in your life. You, and you know what you said? Every day, I actually wrote a book, and, I, and, and this is one thing I've learned from in my experiences. You can't wait till a crisis comes, and then this is these are you have to do these techniques, these tools every single day. If you wait till a crisis, boy, that next crisis might knock you flat. So it's 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 every day. Every day work, every every day work. Are you working on any other books, false? And if so, can you give us yeah. a glimpse into what you're yes, working on? Yes, I am. Now? I'm actually, I'm actually starting, uh, just getting ready to start the writing phase of the of the Fix Yourself Handbook Two. And the reason I'm doing this is, again, that's another hole in self help literature. Uh, it is, you know, okay, we're, we're going to move you through the, the horrors or the dysfunction or just the unhappiness of your life and get you to a new place. But that new place is a place you've never lived before. So it's unfamiliar territory, and that's one of the reasons why people go back to the dysfunction, because they know how to live there. But when we get them to the next stage, it's uncharted territory. So I want to present a book that's going to go chapter by chapter like I did. Just, it's just going to take the second book and chapter by chapter say, good, you made the changes. Now here's how you're going to stay here. Tell us where listeners can get a copy of, of, your, of your book. Where can listeners get a copy of the Fix Yourself Handbook? Yeah, you can go. You can go to the website that you mentioned earlier in the interview, fosterjerald.com, and you can find the places to buy it there. Also, the book. The, the, my website is dedicated solely to the book, so you'll see chapter outlines and uh, excerpts from the book, all the kind of things you can look at and say, "Do I really want to get this?" If you do, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, all the usual retailers have it. Oh, thank you so much! Oh my goodness, 
We have been just blessed to have false Regario here with us on Off the Shelf this morning. He's the author of the book, The Fix Yourself Handbook, Using the Process Way of Life to Transform Your Life into a Happy, Healthy Journey. If you came in to, uh, I want to give you his website again. It's falsregario.com, F-A-U-S-T-R-U-G-G-I-E-R-O.com. Again, that's F-A-U-S-T-R-U-G-G-I-E-R-O.com. False Regario, again, the author of the Fix Yourself Handbook. If you came in on the show late or midstream and you're like, oh, my gosh, I missed it, no worries. Once it finishes streaming, it will be in the archives, and then you can go back and listen to it as many times as you like and, and encourage you to get a copy of the Fix Yourself Handbook. After listening to Foss, you might say, see that you like his approach and then uh, uh, get, get a copy of the book. Thank you so much, Foss, for being here with us, and I thank all of our off-the-shelf listeners who not only were here with us today, but you've been with us for over 15 years that we've been on the air. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Happy, happy Valentine's Day. And as I always tell you, you guys are so amazing. You're incredible. You're awesome. Go out and create a fabulous day for yourself. Foss, I'll shoot you an email with a link to the show when it finishes streaming. I thank you for everything you shared and all the good work you're doing. Thank you so much. Bye for now.